The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Jeff Gothelt. Now, Jeff and I know each other well from being authors in the Lean series. In fact, the way I actually met Jeff is he was one of the first reviewers of Lean Enterprise. The first draft, he told me it sucked. We've been best friends ever since. So it's a pleasure to have him on the show to actually share his new book, Forever Employable, and stories about where he's had to both learn and unlearn throughout his career to be forever employable. We dive deep on how he recognized when he needed to change, how he's built his personal brand or perspective, really based around his purpose, his values and the mission that he hopes to bring to the world. It's been a fun episode to talk to him. I think you're going to enjoy it. But before we dive in, let's go back to the beginning and the real turning point for Jeff, the moment that he realizes that it was time to become forever employable. I wake up on my 35th birthday and I'm in a panic. I'm in a cold sweat. And by all accounts, I've done everything right. Everything's good. Everything is what it should be. I'm married. I have two kids. I have a house. I got a couple of cars. I live in the New York City suburbs. I've got a good paying job in New York City. Everything's the way it should be, the way that it was supposed to be and planned. And I kind of marched my way. But I wake up on my 35th birthday and I'm terrified. I'm terrified that in five years, five years from then, I will be 40, which meant at that point from that side of 40 that I would be old, I would be overpaid and unemployable. Because I was managing a design team in New York and I was hiring younger designers. And these designers that I was hiring were better than me. They were faster than me. They had but newer skills, they were hungrier than me, and they were cheaper than me. I knew that because I know what I was getting paid and I know what I was paying them. And I was terrified that in five years, my skills were going to atrophy and my salary requirements were going to be too high and I wasn't going to be able to find jobs. And I was seeing this happen with colleagues who were a little bit older than me as well. And so I made a resolution. I resolved that morning to myself to never look for work again. That panicked, oh my God, I got to update my resume and apply for jobs and chase down these leads and get the next thing and the incremental salary bump and the incremental title and a couple more people to manage. I'm not going to do that anymore because I'm going to lose that game. The higher up you go in the corporate ladder, the fewer jobs there are. That's the nature of leadership and management, right? And so I decided I'm not going to look for jobs anymore. I'm going to have jobs look for me, have the work find me. So I love this for a number of reasons. The first thing that sort of spins to my mind is, you know, it feels like the corporate race or whatever you want to describe it is, you're sort of, you're pushing your way. You know, you're pushing past people. You're fighting to get that job, get that promotion. You're pushing. And yet what you're describing to me here, which I really love, is a pull system, is instead of pushing yourself into the world, you're going to create pull that people want to come to you. Now, I like that. So how did you sort of find that little transition? It's fun to say those words. I'm never going to look for work again, right? Jobs are going to find me. And and then the birds are tweeting and the crickets kick in and you go back (laughs) and finish your coffee or whatever. But no, Right, and rewrite my resume. (laughs) (laughs) Right, but no, so I say those words and then like four big questions come up immediately. And the first one is, does anyone know who I am? And to be clear, the year's 2008. So we've got the internet, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got social media. Does anyone know who I am? Why would they come looking for me? And this was a big question for me. Great question, yeah. Right? What problem do I help people solve? And that to me was the key thing that I really wanted to focus on was if I'm going to drive work to me, if I'm going to create this poll, what's my value proposition? What's the problem that I help people solve? Because the work that I want to attract to myself, it needs to be work that I want to do and not just kind of any old thing. And so to me, that meant that I had to explicitly tell the world 
who I was, where I can help them and where they can find me and what problems I solve for them. And that's what I set out to do explicitly. The resume, it, you're just describing what, you know, it's what, what, what. Uh, you know, I know how to use Java. I know how to do somersaults. But I think the question you're really talking here for me is much more profound. It's much more going to like your why you exist and how you can help people be successful. And I think that that's a really sort of tough question for people to sort of face down in many respects, especially when you're in the comfort zone of you're a, a manager of managers, you're you know, well paid, you're in this sort of position that you've been told you need to work towards your entire life. So why should you change then? Or why would you even want to reevaluate your sort of deeper why you exist and how you can help people where others can't? That's uncomfortable for people to put themselves in that position. So how did you sort of start taking those sort of steps? And what were some of the things that, may, that you know, maybe even surprised yourself as you started reflecting on those questions? So the first thing I did ask myself is, okay, what am I good at? <laughs> right? I mean, really, what value have I provided up until this point? So at this point, 2008, 2009, I'm about a decade into my career, just to give you a sense. I got a bit of a late start in my professional career because I attempted to be a rock star for a few years after university, right? I toured around with a couple of bands. I've heard the album. It's good. I think you're <laughs> underselling right. yourself. That's right. That's right. I forgot. I forgot you've had some kind of direct experience with the old rock bands. But my ears yeah. are okay. My ears are okay. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. So I'm, what am I good at? What do I know how to do? And there were basically two things that I knew a lot about in 2008, 2009. I knew a lot about software design and development, but design was really my expertise. And I knew a lot about vintage electric pianos. <laughs> that was like the other thing I happened to know a lot about. I oh, collect them. You know, I had a collection in my house for a long time. And, and those are at least two things that I could talk about with any semblance of credibility. And so you assess your expertise. I assessed my expertise. And then I said, okay, great. Where is the world heading? Right? Kind of like, and where is my audience really? And where's the audience growing? Because ultimately, if you're going to plant a flag somewhere, you want to plant it in a growing market, right? Rather than a niche one or one that's, that's shrinking. And sadly, the vintage electric piano market is not growing. It's a very niche culture. And software design and development certainly growing and continuing to grow. So I decided to double down and I said, look, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to create a public presence. You can call it a personal brand. I know some people poo-poo that term. I disagree with that. But I was going to go out there and explicitly start sharing my expertise. And my expertise at that time was, was software design, user experience design, that type of thing. And that's what I set out to do initially. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is great as well. Like the evaluation step is kind of interesting as well. Like being sort of candid and honest with yourself, like really in essence, owning what you believe you're good at or what you actually enjoy as well, I think is a real important part of what you're describing here. And I like this notion of like picking where you're going to play and you're going to play to obviously where you think you can potentially win as well. Software feels like, and, and I can imagine at the time it's a growing industry, in retrospect, you can see why you sort of chose that path. So how then, as you start to get started to build up this sort of brand or awareness, or it's a very competitive space, software as well too, right? Like there's, people see it's lucrative. They see that there's a lot of benefits to being in that industry. How do you also find the sort of style or the way you not only position yourself, but like what are the sort of values and principles you're going to live by to sort of grow what become your brand over time? What were some of those decisions? you have to sort of make? Because that's very different from the internal sometimes company brand of like Jeff runs the design team, he'll help you out, he'll, he's difficult to work on this situation. You know, what were some of those choices you had to make as you bring this sort of personal or public persona to life? It's overwhelming when you sit out in this direction and say, look, I'm going to create a presence for myself. It's overwhelming. Today, it was Seemingly equally overwhelming, even back in the mid 2000s, I set out to talk about user experience design, software design, and even back then, 2003, 2005, 2008, 2009, it felt like 
everything had already been said. What could I contribute to the conversation that hasn't already been said? I actually did this research exercise recently where I went back to try to find the earliest blog post I'd ever written. What was the first thing I wrote? And I think I found it, I wrote in 2003. So this is roughly when I was 30, right? So five years before the epiphany or the big resolution. And it was a blog post I'd written comparing creating wireframes with HTML versus Visio, right? That's what I knew how to write about. And so yeah. it seemingly, it's not like there were no articles written at that time comparing tools for creating wireframes, but this was my experience. And that when I found that article and when I thought about that, to me, there was a realization there that I can tell this story because this is my story. No one else has this story. Right? The steps that I took to get to the knowledge point that I have with these two tools or with my job or with my leadership experience or whatever it is, no one took those steps. No one has ever taken those steps. I'm the only person who did the things to get me where I am today. And with that, I can tell a story that no one else has. And that's how you start to differentiate it and stand out. This just resonates massively with me. It's funny as you're sharing sort of this stuff. Similarly for myself, you know, the first blog I ever wrote was called The Systemico Model. And it was basically a model for prioritization. And I remember like thinking about writing something was the most alien thing in the world for me. Like I'm dyslexic, solid history of like D plus in English literature. And I was working in ThoughtWorks at the time. And the way I was working was people were asking me to sort of show them how things were being done and you know, and then someone just said to me, like, why don't you just write about this? And every part of me was like, writing? Are you joking? Like, who's going to read it? Nobody cares about what I think. I don't even know if I know what I think. But, you know, it was good enough that there was people that encouraged me a little bit to do that. And all those sort of questions that you're sort of touching on as well, it's like, what new do I have to say? What's different yeah. about what I, everybody knows this stuff? Like, all the imposter syndrome just like, lives and breathes up and becomes a monster, right? And uh, Does that ever and, go away, by the way? No, I don't <laughs> think it does, no. But the bit that really just what you were saying before that jumped out at me is that it's your perspective and that's unique, you know? And that's one thing I definitely would share with many people if they ever reach out about how to sort of start down such a path is like, it's your perspective, which makes it unique. And, you know, I sit in hundreds of talks or watch videos or whatever it is. And invariably, I always leave a session that I think I have a, sen a knowledge about with one little thing where it's some little unique perspective that somebody has. And that's actually the highlight often of the conferences in some respects for me or whatever, or the articles you read. And I think trusting in that is hard for people. So how do you help them then get started? Like, how do you give them maybe that little bit of confidence to face the uncertainty, to face the imposter syndrome and get started. What are some of the thoughts you have in that space? It's super interesting. So I've been starting to tell this story, this forever employable story now for the last couple of months. And one of the qualities that I discovered in myself to build the kind of career that I have today and the kind of career that I advocate for in the book is self-confidence. And when I've been talking to a few folks about this recently, audi different audiences and webinars and that type of thing, we do polls. I list the five qualities and I say, which of these qualities do you have the most of? And inevitably, self-confidence is always the lowest. Interesting. Yeah. People massively, massively underestimate themselves. People suffer from this imposter syndrome and the self-confidence. And for me, what I look for and what I've been coaching folks to think about is I guarantee you there are experiences that you've had in your life that have given you some self-confidence or have proven to you that you have self-confidence. You know, we talk about other qualities like this entrepreneurial spirit, right? If you're going to build this thing, treat yourself, your career as a product you have to have this entrepreneurial spirit and treat your career like you're building a company. I guarantee you, you've done something entrepreneurial in your life, whether it's selling candy at school when you were a kid, like which I did to make some money. I was in bands. We joked about that a second ago, right? I was in bands. Bands are startups, right? Absolutely, bands, like, yeah. Like it's a ridiculous, ridiculous notion that you and your buddies can come up with music that no one's ever heard before and will love and follow. And yet- 
how many people are out there doing it, right? That's entrepreneurial. That's self-confidence. Getting up on stage and playing your music, or yeah. especially original music in front of people, it's massive amount of self-confidence. And so how do you take those experiences and now channel them into your career? And to me, if we can remind people that they've done this before, they might say, oh, all right. Yeah, I've done it. I'm, yeah, I can do this. Like this, this is not a big deal for me anymore. Hopefully it helps them to start to take that step. Yeah, no, I think that's a massively important part. And I think this underlying part you're sort of alluding to as well is doing something that you really enjoy that actually gives you energy. I think that often comes across when people are like care about a topic or are passionate about it. I think that always just shines through like, and just give it a try. So tell me then, what was the sort of first step you sort of took to get going, right? You were 35 in one day, the coffee's worn off or maybe it was, right. there. and you're sitting there thinking like, how do I start on this sort of new mission to build this perspective that I'm going to have um, to start building this idea of a foreverable, employable person that I want to be. What were some of those sort of first steps? And I love hearing the sort of steps you, if you could go back and do differently, like what were some of the lessons you learned along the way? Yes. So look, the interesting things throughout my career up until that point, up until roughly 2008, my timing was awful. <laughs> I had really, really terrible time. Like I always showed up too late. I literally missed everything good about the dot-com, the first dot-com before it crashed. My first gig, I ended up at a company that had already gone public. I showed up at AOL after it had peaked. Everything, everything was, I was always too late. But I find myself in 2008, I find myself finally, finally, fi 10 years into my career, finally positioned to catch the wave for the first time, right? Like I totally missed the wave for a decade. And I finally find myself positioned to catch the wave. And the wave in this particular case was the beginning of the global adoption of agile software development methodologies. And one of the biggest challenges of agile software development was how do you integrate design into oh, that yeah. world? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like an ongoing debate. I don't know ongoing, if anyone ever... right? Uh, yeah. Well, there's a book about it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. a good book as well. A couple guys wrote a book about it. That might be a good place to start. But rhymes with bean UX. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but the point is that I'm there. So Agile is on the rise. Design is on the rise because the iPhone has come out a year earlier. Everybody wants to be the apple of everything. And I'm in a position where I have to build a software design team in an organization that's adopting Agile. And the good slash bad news is that no one knows how to do this, or at least no one knew how to do it well in 2008. There was a lot of stories of failure. And so I set out to solve this problem. And I was fortunate enough to find myself in a situation where I had the bandwidth. My boss was nice enough to give me the bandwidth to experiment with better ways of working. And my team and I went out and we talked to other teams that failed at successfully integrating software design and agile software development. And we took their anti-patterns and we learned from them and then we built our own hypotheses and we experimented with these new processes. And every single thing that we did, I wrote about. Yeah, and great. all of a sudden, so I'm telling our story publicly and the company is thrilled for me to do this because I'm amplifying the hiring brand of the organization. Hey, we're doing agile and UX. Hey, we allow people to share their stories. Hey, we're building these really interesting ways of working, so come work here. And all of a sudden, this thing takes off, right? So where I planted my flag, finally, I was in a position where the thing that I was talking about was on the rise, and I was catching this wave on the way up. And so all of a sudden, this conversation grows, and it continues to grow and to scale because we're not the only team that's having this challenge. This is a global issue. Every organization with a software development arm, which is basically every organization of scale, was struggling with this. And so all of a sudden, this conversation goes global, and that begins the pull, right? So all of a sudden, I start to attract new opportunities because the story and the conversation and the sharing has become so powerful, right? So giving all this stuff away starts to attract all these new opportunities my way. What's great here, though, like there's a real system of intentionality going on here, I think. And 
highlighting it to people, I think is really important because you're identifying these like little signals, people talking about a problem that they're struggling to solve. And you're hearing it a lot and a lot and a lot. And why is this such a problem? You know, and that's a feedback mechanism. That's a signal in essence that the market has a problem that needs to be solved. So like, are you listening out for that? Like, what are those conversations you keep hearing again and again and again? I think that's a really important signal for people. And then when you pair that with this sort of notion that you've planted your flag about you're going to play in this space, you know, you're seeing the problems, you're noticing the trends then of at the time this iPhone and design becoming this thing and technology becoming this thing and, and you having a very explicit position and just sharing you're just putting your message out into the world, your perspective. Um, you know, I think there's a very interesting confluence of these things, but it's deliberate, recognizing the problem, thinking of the trend, having a position, and then just putting yourself out there. You know, I think these are really the characteristics I'm hearing in your stories. So how now have you sort of, you've created this sort of system for yourself? So the opportunity arises, you start to see, you start to feel this pull. Yeah. So, you know, the rocket's maybe about to take off. And the question is, have you got a seatbelt on? Do you know where the seatbelt <laughs> is? Or is there even a seatbelt? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, cause, no. so what happens next? Yeah, so it's interesting, right? So in the spirit of unlearning, one of the things, it took me a long time to unlearn it, but in retrospect, I was subconsciously doing it. Today, I, I do it much more consciously, is this idea of giving it all away. So the more I gave away, right, the more came back. The more material that I shared about our work, it's out there for free, it's still out there, right? The more came my way. And so people are asking me to, hey, come give a talk at this event. Can you come talk at our company? Because clearly you're doing this and we don't know how to do this. Can you speak at this conference? And what, what happens is, and I, again, I didn't know this, but tech publishers go to tech conferences and they look for the latest topic and the people who are speaking about it and they offer book deals. And so I got offered a book deal, which was an opportunity I never would have sought out on my own. Frankly, in hindsight, it was something that seemed insurmountable to me. The idea of writing a book, I mean, I was writing blog posts of 500 words, 750 words. The idea of running 50,000 words it's Mount Everest. Like there's just Absolutely, no way. Yeah. 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 yeah no way awesome. I'm climbing that. No way I'm climbing that. But entrepreneurial spirit, self-confidence, right? Sure. Why not sign up for writing a book, right? It's a brutal process. It takes two <laughs> years, right? I burned through three editors. I wrote the manuscript four times and it wasn't until Josh Seiden came on board as co-author and editor, because he and I had been te started teaching the material together at this point, that I could get the book over the finish line and actually published. But then that gets published. And I look, and I've got two years to talk about the book because I'm writing it and it sucks. And so at least talk about how great it's going to be someday. One day. <laughs> One day when it actually ships. And the book comes out and there's tremendous anticipation for it. And that amplifies things even more. So now it's like, hey, come give the talks, come teach workshops, come tell your story. And all of these are new opportunities. And these are revenue generating opportunities, right? So this is stuff that I'm starting to do on the side while I'm employed full time. But ultimately, the mix between sort of the full time job revenue and the moonlighting revenue starts to really shift significantly to the point where leaving the full time world was the next logical step. And I love this as well, because you're actually like taking the small steps to get there. You're exploring uncertainty by taking these little small steps. And as you see signal and things start to work, that's actually giving you more, as you say, self-confidence to take the next sort of bolder step. And well, remember, then, I mean, I have to de-risk, right? I have to because I'm the sole provider for a family of four. So my wife stays home with the kids. The kids are growing up, right? Kids need to eat, Barry, it turns out, like every day. Tell me about it. You, <laughs> yeah. you, you just saw my new one month old. He seems to eat and also gives it back quite quickly. He seems to puke a lot at the moment. But anyway. Congratulations. <laughs> and so like I feel to this day, I still feel this tremendous pressure to provide for my family and to provide them with a level of comfort that they've grown accustomed to. And so there's no way I'm quitting my full-time job and going freelance without any kind of proof, evidence 
that this is actually sustainable, that it's actually going to work. Yeah, and I think this is a really important message, though, as well for people listening. Like, I imagine there's a lot of people in that position where, you know, their family, they're providing for other people, their people depend on them. They may have the entrepreneurial spirit, and yet they feel like they're sort of trapped in some respects. And I think one of the maybe things people also need to unlearn is this isn't like from zero to 100% overnight. You know, I think the process you're describing here is very important about how you've, you know, taken these smaller steps to find out what potentially could work. Maybe as you described, it's the side hustle. It was uh, moonlighting to the point then that you were able to sort of shift that balance. You know, that's really important for people because I think a lot of people probably, especially at the moment, we're in the middle of the COVID crisis. Maybe some people are in situations or even in roles or jobs that they're not really satisfied with. Maybe this is amplifying that, if anything, for them. And they might not see a way out. I think there's a real strong message of that there is a way if you're willing to sort of start to, you know, put your flag somewhere, like look at trends, think about what you're really passionate about, like make a confluence and find that space for yourself and start taking small steps to get there, I think is really empowering advice, I would say, for people to build up the confidence to go after this stuff. Let me be very, very concrete about this. From that, the morning of my 35th birthday, where I resolved to not look for, for jobs anymore, have them find me, to the day that Lean UX was published, my first book, five years. Five years from I got to make a change to yeah. first published book. So yeah, and it was all of those things that you just described, but it took five years to get there. Yeah, and no, I think that's really helpful to put that into context for people that five years to become an overnight success. But it's so funny, like we have so many people on this show, right? Like uh, Eric Reese, another classic, right? You know, overnight success that took him like 15 years of like failing at startups and trying to describe what the hell he was doing to people to like right lean uh, startup, right? So many of the entrepreneurs that have been on the show have been through you know, four or five different businesses where they've struggled and not found out what worked for themselves. And But I think the sort of essence here is it's, there is no sort of start and end, though, also to this point. I think the notion, and I'm sure the reason you chose forever, in, even in your book title, is you just don't do this once and you're done. You just don't unlearn once in life and you're done. This is sort of a continual process, right? So how do you continue to sort of practice this stuff today as you look forward? Right? You've transitioned from being an internal manager right to, to an author to now, you know, Interestingly, I know we both sort of left our jobs to take the entrepreneurial risk together roughly around mm-hmm. the same time, which is for the fun and confluence in many ways mm-hmm. as well. What have been some of the other steps now that you have taken and continue to take or, and some surprise twists and turns along the way? So look, this new turn, this forever employable book, this content is the next attempt call it an experiment at evolving and reinventing and growing the things that I already do. The idea of this book, this idea of this story has been in my backlog for two years. It's been sitting there. I've been terrified to tell it. I'm terrified to write it because I have built up a reputation. I've built up a thought leadership credentials around the ideas of user centricity, digital transformation, business agility, agile and design, those types of things. And this is far, far more personal. You know, I've never written anything this personal. I'm telling my story, albeit starting on the day I turned 35, but nevertheless, it's my story. And I'm talking about how to deal with things that people deal with on a personal basis, not on a team basis, not a corporate basis. And it's a this is kind of the next big step for me, the next big reinvention. And it's an attempt to we were talking about unlearning, it's unlearning the fears of getting personal, becoming vulnerable in public, something I'm not particularly good at. It's not something I've been very good at. It's not something I've done very often, you know, from the stage or in my writing or anything that I've produced. This is by far the most personal and vulnerable thing I've put out there. And I have to tell you, Barry, I've been blown away. The book comes out very soon. I've been putting out a lot of content out there, again, to test it. I've been blown away by the reaction, how much this stuff resonates with people. It's, it's humbling. It stirs up that imposter syndrome all over again, right? But I'm thrilled to see this because 
honestly, I was terrified that people would be like, this is not what you talk about, Jeff, so we're going to stop listening. And then I'd yeah. have to get a real job again. Yeah, well, look, I think there's some really uh, nice nuance here, right? You know, like, just as you sort of had um, gone through your internal corporate career and promoted yourself from widget maker to senior widget maker to manager of widgets, and then you, you've taken this step out into the sort of entrepreneurial risk and obviously done exceptionally well in bringing a lot of your writing and your ideas to the market in terms of software. And now this is another step is how I hear this. And, and what I, is really sort of stands out for me too as well, and I really enjoy hearing you say this, is like the more vulnerable I find we put ourselves out there, the more authenticity we bring to like who we are, what we really care about, it should feel that a little uncomfortable. It is being a little bit bold to sort of get outside our comfort zone. But when you're backing that up with authenticity, with vulnerability, with something that you really believe in, you know, people respond to that because you're telling your story, you're telling what you've learned, you're sharing your mistakes. And, you know, in many ways, that's such a counterintuitive idea for so many people because they're used to someone who knows all the answers, someone who's a deep 25 years expert in every single field. So all these notions that were sort of conditioned about what great is, and yet what great really is, is an often the opposite of that. People who don't know the answers, but are willing to find out. People who are, are willing to say, look, this is my best shot at something. It mightn't be perfect, but it's the best that I've got. This is my experience. Yeah, you know, I've made some mistakes. Things haven't worked out for me, but here's how I responded to that situation. You know, this isn't easy. It's actually really hard and it's been tough for me. And here's why. That's real. That's showing up. That's great leadership. And I think in many ways, that's what entrepreneurship is so about is the moment you start getting comfortable, I think is it may be over for you. I think right. the people like I like hanging out with are the ones that get outside their comfort zone, that cultivate scenarios where they constantly have to grow, where they take a little risk, where sometimes you're going to fall, you know, but you have confidence that you can get back up and go again. And I think that is the entrepreneurial spirit for me, you know, so I think people respond to that and I've no doubt they're going to respond to this book. It sounds like it's going to, and already are, which is exciting. On that thread, there's a phrase that I've taken to heart and kind of made a bit of my own personal mantra that I learned from a TED Talk, which sounds so cliche. <laughs> like, I learned it from a TED Talk. But I did. I did. I watched it. There's a great TED Talk by a guy named Astro Teller, which is a fabulous name to begin with. He's the guy who runs Alphabets. He runs X, Alphabets. X, Google X. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he runs, he's got a great TED Talk where he talks about how they, he encourages learning through failure. And there's a phrase that he uses in that talk where he talks about enthusiastic skepticism. I love that phrase. I love that phrase. I mean, he talks about how he tries to cultivate that kind of spirit in his teams and in his organization. And enthusiastic skepticism means that we might be really good at what we do. We might be really smart. We might be, have a ton of experience. We might, we might even think we've done a tremendous job at something, but we are enthusiastic about finding a better way to do it next time, right? So this was great, but I'm skeptical that it's the best that it's ever been done. There's always a better way, right? And to me, to me, that's kind of the spirit that drives me. It's this enthusiastic skepticism to say, that was pretty good. Like, hey, I wrote a book. That went pretty well. Could I write a better book? Could I do something else? Could I increase my reach? Could I tell a different story? That gets me out of bed every morning, which is super, super exciting. Yeah, I think it's great to hear and it, it resonates massively, you know? And it's funny, it's like this push and pull in many respects of the, you know, you're constantly sitting there with the notion of imposter syndrome every day we wake up and then there's the other voice that's saying, come on, you know, um, maybe I could do better. Actually, maybe... There is another thing to unlock here. And I think that both of those sort of ends of those spectrums, I think if you recognize that they exist in yourself, they actually keep you humble. They keep you a bit vulnerable, but they also accelerate you to push you forward. That's definitely one thing I'd share with people as well. It's like, you know, it's okay to recognize that sometimes you're going to feel like you're going to be found out. Oh, I actually know nothing. This is all, ah. Uh. And, right. and some days you're going to feel like that, you know? And then there's going to be the other days where you're 
energized where you're like, that was great, but you know, how could I make it better? Or how could I do something different to help me grow? And I think those are two really important things to embrace and recognize rather than fear them or say one's right or one's wrong or get trapped in either. Because I think like anything, if you over optimize for one, you'll, you'll sort of stagnate or, or you'll lose people. It's just recognizing them is really important and they can be great forces when you balance them. Look, you reminded me of a story actually that I think kind of sells this concept even further, right? You and I partnered on an engagement along with Josh Seiden a few years ago with Capital One, the, the bank in the US, and found ourselves in a situation where the three of us were coaching the executive team of Capital One, the leadership team of Capital One, on how to run a digital business, an agile business is really what they were trying to do. And you know, I think we found ourselves in a situation where between the 10, 11, 12 of them, they probably, if I was to guess, I'd say that between the 10, 11, 12 of them, they probably had, I don't know, 250 years of experience in managing banks, right? And so who the hell are we, right, the three of us to come in there and tell them how to run their business? Right? It feels like that, right? It feels like that. But yes, those folks knew how to run a bank. We know how to run an agile business, a modern, digital, digitally enabled, agile business, that continuous learning environment, that type of thing. And so once you get over that imposter syndrome that says, I have no business talking to these folks because they're clearly very, very successful folks, there's an opportunity right, to say, look, I actually have some expertise here that they don't have. And, you know, we ended up spending six months with these folks, really getting them to break down their 20, 25, 30 years each of management experience and kind of to relearn it in an agile environment, in a software driven environment, which they didn't have as much experience as we did doing. And I think that 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 is something that you can always kind of try to fall back on when you find yourself in these types of situations. Again, it. it eventually it breaks that imposter syndrome. The moment that you see that you've had an influence on somebody who you thought knew everything, nothing beats that feeling. Right? Oh, absolutely. And, no, it's great you're sharing that story, you know, and as so much of obviously what's encapsulated in Unlearn was actually inspired by a lot of the time we spent with these people, you know, like some of the brightest, most competent people you're ever going to come across and helping them recognize that they actually had limiting behaviors and that they could unlearn and relearn and see that as a system to continuously adapt to changing circumstances. You know, I think, as you say, it was some of the most fun work because we're all on the edge of our comfort zones here, right? Yeah. Like we're pushing ourselves like, look, these are like Fortune 50 executives, like teaching them how to experiment and they're sort of getting outside their comfort zone and finding different ways to work. And it's exhilarating, you know, when you find that sort of collaboration fit, it's often what I describe it both, you know, when we all work together, but also when you find clients that can work with you like that, who are going to take some bold steps, who are going to have some humility and vulnerability. And, you know, I suppose you only have to look at Capital One today. They're probably the most technology enabled uh, financial services organization in the world, right? They've the most amount of AWS engineers of any corporation in the world. They're building and releasing products faster than any other companies. And I think their leadership or role modeling taking those steps right up and down the company. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of, of all of our contribution to that. And I mean, our in terms of both that leadership group and ourselves. So it's great to hear that you're also going to bring, you know, those lessons to people in this book, you know, Absolutely. and I think that they're the best people, the ones that are constantly looking to challenge themselves. That's one thing that always stood with me with their CEO said is, you know, like we're actively got to get outside our comfort zones to keep growing, not stagnate. And I think Forever Employable is a great spirit of that. I'm, I'm excited to hear what happens next. So what is the next step then, Jeff? You know, we've, we've got the book coming out. You know, you're continuing to help and coach people all over the world. What are some of the things you're excited about as you sort of look ahead? Yeah, so the big uncomfortable step is launching this book, right? So that some folks have read it, but not many. I'm very, very interested to see how the rest of the world receives it and treats it and what they say about it. The other thing that's really interesting for me, and I have no idea what opportunities this is going to bring because this is such a different turn for me. It's such a different direction. I'm really curious to see 
what this pulls in. So we talked about pulls on the system. I'm really curious to see what I reel in with this because there's already some signs of some things coming in and some things that are interesting to me and some things that are potentially less interesting to me. I'm trying to figure out what to do with all of that. But I'm very interested to see what new opportunities this begins to pull in and what direction I move into in the coming years as well. So that's really interesting. And then in the meantime, is there a scaling of my services that I can offer based on this new content that somehow is combined with everything else that we're already doing, right? One of the conversations that I'm actively having these days in public arenas and other places is bringing agility to human resources, right? And so forever employability has a strong play inside organizations and a strong play around this concept of agility in employment, in hiring, in career, in professional development. I think there's something there as well. And I'm super excited to see where that lands. Well, I'm excited to see what you do. I'm sure I'll be sitting on the front row eating my popcorn, watching as you go along. Look, it's uh, it's been a pleasure to have you in the show. I love and enjoy collaborating with you. I look forward to much more great things that we'll do together in the years ahead. And maybe you can make sure that I stay forever employable and keep challenging.